Welcome, everyone, and thank you for attending the final panel of the conference, Political Lotteries, the Future of Democracy. Um, so we decided to end the conference with um, this panel that allows us um, and the audience to have a group brainstorm about some of the benefits and the challenges of using lotteries, and also to tackle some bigger questions. So should we get rid of elections? Can deliberative institutions scale up? What should new areas of research and collaboration be? This is also going to be the chance for you, the audience, to ask um, questions um, and engage with the presenters. And feel free to um, ask as many questions as you'd like, and there will be individuals around to pass you a mic. So once we um, begin the open Q&A, please look to Kira in the back for uh, a microphone. Um, so we'll begin with a half hour of prepared questions and then open it up. But first, I'm very pleased to introduce um, your panelists. So on the far side, Federica Carugati is a senior lecturer in history and political economy at King's College London. Her research, as you've seen earlier in the conference, focuses on two topics, the development of political, legal, and economic institutions in pre-modern citizen-centered governments, and second, the lessons that the emergence, configuration, and breakdown of such institutions hold for the theory and practice of institution building in the modern world. She's the author of two books, A Moral Political Economy, Present, Past, and Future, that's Cambridge University Press, and Creating a Constitution, Law, Democracy, and Growth in Ancient Athens from Princeton University Press, as well as a number of articles published in academic and popular outlets, including an article I love in Wired. Uh, next to her is Dimitri Landa, who's a professor of politics at uh, NYU. His research focuses on democratic theory, formal theory, and political economy, as well as philosophy and law. His recent research has focused on studying deliberation and debate, including experimental and formal work as to what extent the debate process is informative to participants, as well as research on how to structure deliberative activities of argumentation, information acquisition, and learning. Um, most relatedly, he's working on a book manuscript with Ryan Pevnik, also at NYU, entitled Representative Democracy, a Justification um, with Oxford University Press. And this manuscript compares the electoral selection of policymaking officials to salient alternatives, many of which we've talked about today, such as direct democracy, lottery-based systems, and meritocratic alternatives. Uh, next to Dimitri is uh, Philip Lindsay, who leads the Democracy Innovation Hub at the Hannah Arendt Center for Politics and Humanities at Bard College. Uh, since 2022, the Hub has hosted two annual convenings on citizens' assemblies that bring together elected officials, community leaders, advocates, and practitioners to workshop precisely how to scale collaborative governance from a place-based perspective. Um, the Hub also recently hosted the Doing Democracy Differently Teacher Fellowship, which trains high school teachers on how to bring deliberative democracy into the classroom. He's co-founder of the Assembly Project, as we've heard about earlier, and helps coordinate the Energize New York initiative. And last but not least, Chris. Chris Rose is the head of Governance Insights at Meta, where he works across the company to drive thought on emerging trends at the intersection of technology, society, and governance. Prior to this role, Chris helped launch the company's oversight board, as well as serving as a geopolitical analyst at the CIA for a decade, uh, to include a secondment as the President's Daily Brief briefer to then US President Mike Pence, and most re recently served as the senior advisor at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency during the Biden administration. Chris holds a master in public policy from Georgetown and is a team member also with the Council on Foreign Relations. So as you see, we've brought together a combination of academics, practitioners, and folks from industry to tackle these big questions. Now, I've given each of the panelists the opportunity to have opening statements to tell uh, you, the audience, about their current research or their current activities, and we'll start in the order that I introduced you. So, Federica, please. Okay, is this... Good. Okay. Um, so, yeah, Ali asked uh, to uh, for us to give a little bit of a brief, I guess, on the research. Again, I don't want to bore you too much, given that some of you at least have been in the audience long enough to know uh, pretty much uh, what my research is about, but just for the sake of uh, the recording, I suppose. Um, I am uh, trained as a historian, but by ambition, a political scientist, and I study uh, pre-modern governance, particularly pre-modern uh, democratic or collective governance. Um, and after spending a um, some might say too much time uh, thinking about uh, governance in ancient Athens, I decided to broaden the scope of the investigation to studying instances of collective governance in the pre-modern world uh, that go beyond um, Athens, that go beyond, uh, and most recently, uh, Europe, uh, with the uh, 
hope that um, broadening the scope of the investigation on historical collective governance might give us uh, better, more robust insights about what collective governance might look like today. And so the idea is not so much to sort of like uh, uh, lose myself in uh, uh, historical experiments or historical um, evidence, but it is to bring that evidence to conversations about building democratic spaces today, particularly at a time when uh, democracy seems to be uh, not as uh, cool an experiment as we thought uh, maybe a couple of decades ago or even uh, less than that. Um, so again, I think that just to be uh, relatively brief and clear, I think that there is a lot to learn about historical collective governance for building a theory, a more robust theory of collective governance today, but also to really um, uh, provide uh, uh, additional sort of like a food for thoughts for all those communities, many of which we have discussed today, that are trying to build uh, collective governance spaces uh, online and offline. Um, and I think that uh, this is what my research is trying to do, although it is somehow uh, and often, perhaps too often, uh, dorking out on things historical. It is uh, uh, pretty much uh, uh, inspired by a focus on practice and a focus on applications uh, in the present. Great. Thank you, Federica. Dimitri? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> um, I work at the intersection of uh, political economy and political philosophy, and I want to, um, in my remarks, what I want to do is to suggest a perspective on mini-publics and autocratic governance that comes from thinking about what political economic models, and in particular strategic models of decision-making, um, tell us about these things. Um, and I'd like to talk in particular about two sets of political economy models, models of communication and uh, models of delegation. Um, a key result of uh, the strategic models of communication, many of which focus on the scenario of committee decision making, committee deliberation prior to collective uh, policy choice, um, is that participants' willingness to engage in a kind of open-ended deliberation is critically conditioned on their expectations of how their speech might affect the ultimate committee decision. Um, in essence, these models study the various ways in which a participant's communication strategy, what to say, how to interpret what others say, whether to speak or listen, um, are sensitive to the details of the policy selection rules after communication. And a key expectation here is that participants behave in a relatively um, you know, manipulative kind of way, not as ideal type participants in what you know, Jürgen Habermas called ideal speech situation or Josh Cohen, ideal deliberative uh, position. Um, Moving on to the strategic models of delegation, a key result here is that, by and large, um, strong accountability incentives make for tighter connection between the interests of the participants um, and, uh, um, and, and the principles. Uh, so in the interest of, in particular, the, the interests of the principles voters and the, um, and the choices those who are, uh, of those who are making choices on their behalf, which is to say um, politicians, uh, uh, members of uh, uh, legislative bodies or executives, there are some exceptions to this, um, such as pandering, for example, and closely related to that perverse effects of transparency. But those exceptions um, have to do not with whether you want accountability, but whether you want stricter or weaker incentives via the accountability channels. The bottom line from these kinds of models is that accountability via selection and treatment mechanisms is how you make representation work. So now let's think about the relation between these expectations, right, from these uh, you know, two sets of models, strategic models of communication and strategic models of delegation, um, and, and, and the way many publics work. So with respect to the strategic models of communication, you take away the binding policy choice, and you remove a key factor that is responsible for manipulative communicative posture that strategic models of communication describe. In other words, by taking away the binding policy decision, you remove a key impediment to open-ended deliberative exchange. Now there's a worry uh, by removing an extrinsic motivation uh, to effect a certain kind of you know, binding policy outcome as a result of communication, you're also removing incentives to uh, make careful kind of thought out decisions. But I think um, what we see is that citizens' juries, among other types of uh, mini publics, replace extrinsic with intrinsic motivations. Participants are keen to be there and to engage with each other. Of course, this leaves issues on the table with respect to the relationship between the distribution of intrinsic motivations and the distribution of participants' prior beliefs, their demographic characteristics, and so on. But these are arguably solvable kind of technical issues, and the stratification-based sample selection techniques are, in fact, increasingly effective in solving them. If you now go back to the strategic models of delegation that I described, 
um, many publics give up accountability of the represented, and by doing so, they presumably raise the specter of decision making that does not represent voters' interests, but because they don't make binding policy decisions, the worry is much more attenuated. Um, if what we have in mind are consultative, point of information kind of bodies, the concerns with accountability are arguably not so pressing. So both sets of strategic problems with communication and with faithful representation appear to be at least attenuated, if not entirely eliminated, by the lottery-based many publics being deliberative, but not ultimately policy-making bodies. So here comes the challenge, right? Is this a stable in the sense of equilibrium outcome, right? Are we improving and refining the quality of many publics? And as we are doing this, are we not increasing their attractiveness as substitute policymakers, or at least as authoritative kind of deference requiring decision makers. This is not the point about whether scholars or activists are seeking to use many publics as substitutes or supplements of existing institutions of electoral democracy. Rather, this is a point about the equilibrium authority with which recommendations of many publics um, would be endowed by the citizens, which is to say how the citizens themselves would perceive many publics. The more reliable and authoritative citizens perceive them to be, and so the more differential to them the citizens would become, the stronger the incentives for the participants to engage in manipulative speech and to depart from faithful representation become. In other words, the more relevant the strategic models of communication and delegation become. Um, there's a further threat to the stability of the normatively attractive model of many publics that relates to Ali's and Brenda's work that we heard about today. The more influential the many publics are, the more parties want to control them because ultimately, Parties are multidimensional issue aggregates, and they're constrained by considerations of political feasibility in the way that deliberative mini publics are not. Parties and other long-term decision actors should then be naturally expected to look for ways to co-opt and constrain authoritative mini publics to avoid being left holding the bag. So you can think of the considerations I described as a kind of paradox of authority for autocratic mini publics. The threat to the authority of mini publics is from their becoming authoritative. But it's, if it is a paradox, it's not the kind that comes with an absurd proposition, since we can readily make sense of it analytically. Um, whatever it is, I think it raises a, a set of important questions that is worth thinking about. Whether expectations um, from the many existing mini public experiments can be expected to scale up and persist over the long run. What we can plausibly hope the roles of mini publics to be, and you know, in the long run, how enthusiastic about them ultimately we should be. Thank you, Dimitri. Phil, go ahead. Well, was fascinating. I feel like I need five minutes to just reflect on it. I don't know if this is on, but yeah. um, am I loud enough? Yeah. Now it's on. There we go. Um, yeah, that was fascinating to, to think through. Um, and so my name is Philip Lindsay. I lead the Democracy Innovation Hub at the Hannah Arendt Center, Bard College. Um, I found myself on the way up to the Hannah Arendt Center to a conference that they were running before I joined two and a half years ago. Um, the Hannah Arendt Center has been running conferences for the past 15 years on different topics, social media, um, civil disobedience. We bring together journalists, activists, uh, elected officials, writers, thinkers for a couple of days every year. And for two years, from 2020 and 2021, the theme of the conference was sortition and spaces of power. Um, and I was on my way up. I, I, I signed up to attend the conference. As someone who uh, was on their way to become a social studies uh, uh, teacher, I was, I was thinking of, I just quit my job at a community outreach center in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, where I live. Worked at a community health center for three years and was ready to go back into teaching, thought that was the best way for me to, to be working with young people on civics and getting young people engaged in democracy. That's really what drives me. Um, this conference blew my mind because I had no idea about the history of random selection, sortition, um, in, it you know, made me feel quite ignorant, but it's also a failure of our public school system, I think. Um, and it totally energized me. I was feeling quite down about the possibilities for comprehensive um, approaches and solutions to what we are facing as a society. I felt like our society was collapsing around me. I feel like we were not coming up with the sort of collaborative problem solving mechanisms that we desperately needed. And when I started learning about these assemblies, 
at the uh, conference and and uh, um, I was I was re-energized. And for the past two and a half years, essentially, basically all of my time has been dedicated to organizing a space at the Arendt Center called the Democracy Innovation Hub that tries to energize others around these same issues, or the same the same model. Although I would say we're not obsessed with one model. We don't think citizens' assemblies are gonna save the world or that there's one type of assembly that should be implemented everywhere. Um, I think what inspired me and re-energized me was the idea of bringing everyday people, not just to get to uh, come into a room and, and, and talk, but to have a, sh the, the question that, that really has inspired me is, if you were to design an ideal learning space that empowered people to take action over their own lives and the lives of their communities, what would it look like? I think if you try to answer that, you you get something towards a citizens' assembly of of a of a of some sort. Um, this idea of bringing people together and intentionally mixing in the society, intentionally mixing the society, getting people to see other parts of the society that they are not inter interacting with every day, um, from all kinds, you know, crossing barriers and neighborhoods, um, is something that inspired me. And so, what have we been doing at the at the center? We've run three major convenings. Um, the first one was was 2022. Uh, we had over 50 um, participants up in the Hudson Valley at Bard. And the the intent, similar to an assembly, is that we try to really bring together people that are, are maybe not talking to each other, but are are somewhat could be primed or could be interested in this model. And we say let's work together to scale some of these and co-design them from a place-based perspective. That is, let's not just copy what X, Y, and Z country or, or place is doing. Let's ask what would it mean to rebuild trust in our locality from the ground up, but also from the inside out and the outside in. So we've done that. We've been doing that in the Hudson Valley. And so there's, there's working groups of uh, both elected officials and everyday people who have come together to start exploring these ideas in, um, in and around Bard. And then we've also done that in New York City, where I live. You heard from Forrest earlier. Um, essentially, we've run these, these, these uh, two convenings and one uh, teacher training workshop. And the last convening uh, really brought together the teachers with the elected officials and community leaders. So we had over 140 people in New York City um, just a few weeks ago. Um, and it was a really inspiring, dynamic group of people exploring models from all over the world. But then importantly, it wasn't just, it's like, how do we model this? Like if you even think about the way this room is structured, the way we we're doing public meetings, the way we do conferences, if we start thinking with a, with a design perspective, we could redesign the way we're doing a lot of these convenings to workshop these ideas. Now, again, this is not coming from a research perspective. This is like, I'm, I'm way on the applied side, right? But the idea is to bring, to, to, to have it be a mix of academics, practitioners, um, uh, advocates, students, young people. They should be in the room co-designing these processes, thinking through how they might work, how they're affected by them. Um, and so that last convening we've just done really is a culmination of a, lot of, their, of a lot of the work we're doing, training teachers, doing workshops with city agencies, trying to figure out um, how a process might fit into a city agency, how a, a city agency could pilot a process. Um, and so we workshopped two uh, live initiatives in New York City in this last convening. One was um, Energize New York that you heard about earlier today, and another one was a, was a possible assembly on some topic with the mayor's office of, of engagement in New York City. Um, so that's kind of our model is like you build a you build a space and then you ask people, you invite people in to, to co-design uh, the, the, the assembly or the, or the series of assemblies with you. The last thing I would just say is that we're at the Hannah Arendt Center and there is a, a, a deep theoretical connection to her work and her, you know, that, that uh, conference that inspired me, this, this idea of, of it being a deeply human thing to need to be seen in public, to need to appear in public with other people and to take action with other people as being deeply human is, is why we're, is one of the reasons uh, we're at the event center. And um, yeah, I'm happy to be here. I hope I didn't go over my time. <laughs> You're good. You're great. Finally, Chris. Great. Um, 
Thank you. It is wonderful to be here, and I'm really grateful to be um, learning from folks that are so studied and so uh, such deep experts on this issue, on these various um, these various approaches to democracy. And thank you, Ali, for inviting me and also for hosting this. Um, I have found it to be so interesting. And as the neophyte in the room, I think the resident neophyte, um, I'm just I'm thrilled to kind of uh, hear about all the various innovative approaches that um, that governments, that organizations, and that um, certainly researchers are taking um, to innovate democracy. Um, so I come, uh, as Ali mentioned, from Meta, and I'm thrilled to be here because um, at Meta, we are taking um, the first steps that we believe are important to democratize inputs into our innovation. And so my team is the governance team. We sit at the intersection of technology and society. Our mission is to really elevate user voice into our innovation. Um, and so our flagship initiative, which we launched three years ago, is, um, as Ali mentioned, is called the Oversight Board. It's been termed the Supreme Court for Facebook, but essentially it is a recourse or redressal mechanism um, that everyday users can um, appeal to. It's an independent institution that we de that we established, um, but we have uh, in, uh, enshrined through a series of bylaws and governing documents that it has independent decision making and binding authority over Meta um, when it comes to individuals' content. So if you use one of Meta's platforms and you disagree with the decision that we've taken on your content, for the first time in human history, you can appeal to an external body that has binding authority over the company. And so we think that that's a really important first step in governing um, in governing the company and divesting power away from a small set of individuals at, at one company to have such an impact on things like freedom of expression. But we also recognize that fundamentally that is a redressal mechanism or recourse mechanism. And so um, we have been experimenting over the past two years in, de in deliberative discourse and deliberative democracy to democratize inputs into our innovation at the onset. And so we've been really, really thrilled to start taking steps in this direction and to um, iterate throughout um, throughout each pilot that we've that we have um, we've pursued. Um, about two years ago, we um, ran our first pilot that was focused on what we should do on climate misinformation on our platform. Um, the second pilot that we held was about a year ago, and it was on specific policies related to the metaverse. And then most recently, we were thrilled to host a, um, a community forum, that's our term for it, um, on generative AI and the principles that should underpin how we innovate our generative AI products. And so I can share just a little bit about the approach. Each one has been slightly different. Um, but we partner, um, as, a, as a company, we partner with Stanford's Deliberative Democracy Lab um, to do a deliberative poll. So that's actually the, the format of the mechanism. Um, and then we also partner with the Behavioral Insights Team, a behavioral economics organization um, and social science um, firm um, to help us con uh, design and to also vet our materials and our approach and our design to ensure it's um, as, as free as possible from bias. And so um, the way that the, the process works, and um, we've been really pleased to date, but we're also really open to innovating further, um, is that um, we seek out a representative sample of the public. We use a, a polling firm. So people don't need to actually be users on our platforms. They don't need to have any, any um, specific expertise. We go out and recruit um, everyday people that want to participate. Um, we then provide them an education uh, education packet with uh, background on the topic that we are seeking their input on. Um, that packet has background uh, um, background context. It's written um, at a at an accessible level. We work with the Behavioral Insights team to do that to make it tangible and accessible. Um, and then um, we provide that packet as a pre read to participants. Participants then um, join the, the forum remotely and virtually through Stanford's deliberative platform that is AI facilitated and guides them through, without human uh, moderation, um, guides the participants through a series of questions and proposals. So we, um, we may have a, an overarching topic that we want their feedback on, um, but we provide in the education material a series of different ideas that um, for how we might approach a particular problem and um, the associated pros and cons to unpack the tensions that are um, inherent within that particular topic. So for example, on the, the most recent um, forum on generative AI, we wanted to hear people's perspectives on how 
um, how chatbots should foster connection with humans. It's a major topic um, because chatbots have such great promise and generative AI has such great promise to alleviate um, symptoms of loneliness. There's there's a growing, a small but growing body of evidence about its utility in co cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, but at the same time, there's also m real risks in um, for people engaging with chatbots. There was one f famous case in Europe in which um, one individual committed suicide after engaging a chatbot, and it encouraged him to commit suicide. And so these are these are um, technologies that are transformative, but also have um, real risk for offline harm. And so we wanted to ask participants about what they thought on how chatbots should establish connections with humans. And as a part of that, we would unpack the pros and the cons of a series of, of proposals. Um, the, the participants enter this platform, they engage with one another, they debate and share their perspectives. We then um, provide access to a panel of experts that have technical expertise, human rights expertise, research expertise, and the participants are able to ask questions of these um, of these experts. And then there's a session in which um, participants then leave the expert panel, can debrief with one another and share what they learned. Um, and the way that we actually solicit their direct input is through a deliberative, this is a deliberative poll. And so they take a poll before and after the forum um, so that we can understand how their views may have changed. Um, and so we think that this has been kind of a really great experiment in deliberative discourse. Our first kind of learnings from the from the pilots, um, we're still pending the results from, from this particular forum, um, but that we've been really thrilled that people, first of all, um, as I think evidenced by all the all the research and everything that's been shared here, people are willing and they are able to engage deeply with one another on very complex issues. And so it gives us great hope that people can um, can discuss some of the most pressing issues of our time and actually develop and develop really rich, meaningful results through deliberation. Um, the the other learning is that um, people appreciate having a voice, and um, that's something that we have found with the oversight board in terms of empowering people to appeal to a body that can overrule Meta. Um, but we also reckon, and I think um, the data to date in our, our forums suggests that people actually there's a there's a um, a positive. Um, change in which they they have cited that they have been really um, appreciating the experience. Um, but we also know that these the legitimacy of, of such systems only matter, and we've heard this throughout the day to day, um, only matter when there's actually tangible outcomes that come from these forums. And so whereas our oversight board has binding authority over Meta, this model is advisory in nature. And so what we are doing moving forward is developing a much more robust way that we can share how the, the results of the forum and how the feedback that we receive from the participants actually will inform our innovation moving forward. Um, and then lastly, I would just say that um, we believe um, through this through this particular model that technology offers a great opportunity to scale discourse. Um, and I know a lot of the um, deliberative assemblies in, in history have been in person. Um, given Meta's scale of having over 3 billion users on our platforms, um, and given the global nature of the company, we really are looking to technology to be something that can be an enabler. Um, at the same time, that creates its own set of risks. Ali was one of our observers at the forum a couple weeks ago, and we've had great conversations, and she's offered great feedback about the unevenness um, that comes inherent with technology. So there's this great promise of scale, but also a potential risk of, of uneven, uh, uneven discourse. And so we're just really looking forward to continuing to innovate further. I think I really appreciate the spirit of kind of throughout the day, people talking about different models and what might work here might not work in another context and what may have worked in, in the past may not necessarily work in the future. And so we're very open-minded to continuing to innovate, but I think our mission really moving forward is to continue to to solicit um, input and to democratize inputs into the company. Thanks. Excellent, thank you, Chris. As you can see, we constructed the panel with a wide range of viewpoints. And so now we're going to um, discuss a lot of pressing issues about lotteries that tap into each of the panelists' individual expertise. But we're gonna start with the big one, kind of the elephant in the room, which is assume that democracy is dying and elections are broken. Should we just get rid of elections? Should we make a radical change and stop electing our politicians, so our congressmen or our parliamentarians, if you're in Europe, uh, and switch to a sortition-based institution? Is that possible? Should we do it? Uh, Dimitri or Federica, if one of you want to take this one. Okay, I'll start. Um, 
I, I have a sense that you know defenses of mini publics often have two two components, um, a kind of a very pessimistic, almost almost mordant element, and a highly optimistic, you know, sometimes even joyous one. The the pessimistic has to do with the existing electoral institutions, and the uh, and the optimistic one has to do with you know wonderful replacements that are being suggested, including of course autocratic institutions. And I'm not sure that this is a, an apples to apples comparison. Um, I think there's a kind of a tendency that goes with this, of course, to see the status quo, to treat the status quo institutions as the proper uh, benchmark version of representative democracy. This is this is it, folks, right? That like that. Um, but I'm not. And, and if it is, then maybe we should get rid of elections, right? Maybe maybe that's right. But that seems a little too hasty. Um, and I don't I don't think that the status quo version of uh, representative democracy is the is the proper benchmark version. Um, and, and so I, I do think it's a comparison of an apple to an orange, uh, a kind of inferior um, institutional form of electoral regime to potentially superior or arguably superior uh, within the set of autocratic regimes, um, institutional form of another, you know, if we're talking about autocracies or if we're talking about modified direct democracies, some kind of modified direct democracy version, uh, which is to say, I don't think that's a fair comparison. Um, there are many ways, it seems to me, in which we might go about reforming electoral systems from within without giving up on the idea of electoral representation uh, or of political accountability on which the idea of electoral representation rests. Um, one important principle of institutional design that I think um, kind of speaks to many concerns that um, a lot of critic critics of elections have raised is that is a very intuitive idea that we should seek to minimize the influence of the political actors over the rules of their own political contests. Uh, the basic intuition there is that it's precisely that kind of influence that gives rise to corrupted electoral system. And of course, very few electoral regimes today come anywhere close to implementing this principle. So it seems like to me that there are, and this is just one example, but it seems to me that there are many ways in which we might look to institutionalize something like this, including, by the way, via something like uh, um, you know, randomly selected uh, electoral commissions that Christian was speaking about earlier today. Right. Um, so there's a lot of room for innovation and improvement from within the electoral system. So I, I, I think it's too hasty. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. And I'm just going to add uh, uh, one thing. I, I, don't, I don't think, I guess I'm, I'm challenging the premise on a, on a different uh, uh, aspect. Uh, I don't think that democracy is dying. If democracy is dying, I don't think that democracy is dying because of elections or uniquely because of elections. Um, and what I see in the research that I conduct on uh, uh, pre-modern democracies or collective governance uh, um, is that elections are in fact an element in the soup of collective governance. Um, and so I, what seems to me urgent, however, is to question the role of elections as a unique sort of like a form of, uh, for eliciting the uh, um, uh, popular preferences um, and to identify the proper space for electoral politics vis-a-vis -vis autocratic policy or other types of, of policy. Um, the problem, however, seems to me, and I think that the, the, the discussion that we had today uh, sort of like has cemented some of the uh, uh, ideas that I arguably came into this, this conference with, which is that we really lack the social science uh, to address this question, to properly understand uh, uh, the relative value and the scope of different types of uh, selection mechanisms. Um, and I, what, what, what worries me is that, um, again, as a social scientist, I think that we do really need to put some of our uh, brains uh, onto this question of trying to understand uh, the relative scope and uh, uh, value of different mechanisms. Uh, but listening to uh, you know, uh, practitioners, I wonder if uh, uh, you know, how the social science actually needs to be integrated and integrate with uh, um, experiments, uh, particular experiments uh, where we see like, sort of like an attempt to just come into the room saying, forget what we know about the past, let alone what happened five minutes ago. Um, but uh, then to think about like how to co-design these spaces. I'm, I'm really of two minds about what the relative value of each uh, approach might be. And I think that ultimately we might need both. And you know, both panelists bring up a good point in that there are many ways to use lotteries. And actually our ability as social scientists to collect empirical data on the highest levels is really hard, right? Because these are governing institutions with real life politicians, parties that are established. But we see a new wave, a deliberative wave of institutions being implemented all over. So citizens assemblies or redistricting or oversight boards. And so maybe this is the future. And I was wondering, Phil, could you maybe 
uh, argue for including more deliberative institutions or the types of activities that uh, your organization does, uh, where should we start? If not at the very top, where should we start at maybe local levels and getting local governments involved to incorporate lotteries? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the way I've been thinking about this and the way I think a lot of people, I, I mean, I say a lot, like the handful of folks who are also in educational institutions, um, which are naturally anchor institutions in communities, right? They order food from a, a local catering uh, company. They serve students, right? Especially if they're a public school. Is how does, how do you think about re, you know, reinvigorating local democracy from a place-based perspective? Um, what I've been really inspired by is this idea that Federica um, kind of hinted at, which is experimenting and collaborating with both um, academics, but then, you know, te local teachers, community leaders on some hard issue that's actually happening in the community. So, for instance, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, um, at Franklin and Marshall, um, they've been running deliberative forums there. Um, you know, at the university space for the past year. I only found out about this a couple weeks ago, but I was immediately inspired to say, yeah, that's a great model that we can take back to Bard. We have not been running deliberative forums. A big part of what the way I see these and the way we see them at the Run Center is as, as schools, as like gyms for democracy, right? Again, I said, if you're going to design a space that gives people the, the practical tools for practicing democracy, it would look something like a citizen's assembly. So, I mean, sitting in a classroom and learning about civics in a passive way is just, it, I don't know if it was ever a good idea, you know? I don't know if it was, that was ever designed, I don't know if it was good for the 20th century, I, I doubt it. I think the things that inspired me to be a citizen were going out and working on campaigns that mattered to me when I was 17. That's why I'm still involved in, pol in you know, policy or democracy in some way. And so if you give young people especially, but also just community members, a different way to engage and you empower them and you also mix them with other folks that they wouldn't normally encounter um, through some deliberative experience. But in a very structured way, again, I think like we're often blind to the amazing sort of capacity of our human capacity to facilitate. We, we don't engage in that. We don't build that muscle in our society. Like we don't build that collaborative muscle. And I think if we started to think about what would it mean to, to give young people the muscles and the, the capacity to facilitate dialogue in their community, like that's a win no matter what. We can start doing that. I don't, I, I mean, maybe there's a, I'd love to hear a counter argument against this, but like problem solving, uh, active listening, um, psychosocial skills that enable people to collaborate on better problems. Like I, I'm sure Meta th would love to hire more people that are good at that, right? So I, I think if we start doing that as educational institutions on real existing projects locally, um, partnering with elected officials who want to facilitate some deliberative processes, not just deliberations, but also leading to action. That's the way we've been thinking about it from the Democracy Innovation Hub is like bring all those folks that we can together, being anchored in one place. So not trying to say like, this is some solution, but bringing people in to think through this and be inspired by the international examples. Like that's the one thing we've, we've really seen that when you bring people in and give them case studies of like, look, Bogota and Colombia is doing this. Like, why don't we try it, right? Like, people need that right now. Like, people are, especially young people, are, are deeply cynical about the systems we're in. So we need to, to come up with ways to, to um, give them pathways to action that are not just, look at how, look at how bad everything is, you know? <laughs> okay, so we need to be more optimistic and give uh, the youth of today more opportunities to get involved in politics that may be non-traditional. So it's not just go vote, but it's, uh, you know, develop policy positions with people you might never have encountered before. Can I say one more yeah, thing? Yeah, please. To that? Okay, yeah. so that's one thing. Like, I've worked on a lot of campaigns and I've been, I've been burnt out by campaigns. When you work in this political system, you try to achieve a certain goal and your whole outlook is, I'm going to try to get as many votes or as many XYZ, and then it's, it's all or nothing. That it's good. Sometimes it is all or nothing, and it's good to have that spirit. But like, especially young people are craving that sort of uh, Christian. In your presentation, you mentioned that like the call to action, the public service. We're just failing to say to have ambition about what it would look like if we called the public to action in a non-dogmatic, ideological way, in a problem-solving way. I think so. I think um, yeah. I think that aspect of like getting young people involved in in 
re-energizing democracy that isn't just about a specific campaign or a specific individual, like getting someone elected, that's necessary. I'm absolutely against repla- like getting rid of uh, elections like or, or having that framework right now. But I think that model does lead to burnout and disappointment because you it's if you think you're you're gonna win everything by getting one person in office, like you're you're delusional. But young people want to be a part of those kind of campaigns. No, I think that's absolutely right. I'm gonna use that as a segue to talk about how uh, not just young people, but society is changing and that we're going digital. We got our information from different sources. We just, you know, lived through a pandemic where Zoom and other kind of forms of uh, digital communication became our lifeline for a while. And what's interesting, if we think about scale and how to involve more people in deliberative activities, um, I think actually Meta is an incredibly fascinating um, example of this. Now, I got to be an observer, um, and it was it was a, a remarkably well-run platform. The the groups were engaging. Um, you know, the groups kind of acted. If you teach, right? How do you get students to discuss in a deliberative forum? You know, how do you get someone from Florida, someone who's zooming in from New York, someone who's from a you know who uh, worked in AI versus who's worried about losing their job in AI? It was a fascinating experience and maybe the future, right? So if uh, Meta is experimenting, doing this at scale and bringing deliberative institutions um, into a different, into industry, not democracy, right? To industry. Um, I think that's incredibly promising. Um, so I want to hear a little bit more, Chris, about um, do you think that this is something Meta will continue with? Um, obviously, you've had positive experience, but does the platform see it as a positive experience? Are you going to keep expanding so millions of users will give input about issues of today? What do you think the future of this is? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, great question. Um, uh, so it is interesting because actually in one of our pilots to, do, to establish proof of concept of scale, the Metaverse Community Forum, which I mentioned, which a pilot, um, it was a year ago, actually was larger than this more recent one on, on generative AI. It was 6,000 people across 30 countries in 23 languages. What we understood uh, m- may have been, although I, I can't necessarily prove the negative, but may have been the largest deliberative exercise at once in human history. Um, and so certainly scale, the technology allows for a scale that is, um, I think, probably rises to the needs of this of of this moment right where in, trust in institutions are collapsing kind of globally right and so and there's there's less and less confidence in institutions and so that may require and particularly in uh, particularly emerging technologies with um, that no no boundaries may require global solutions or a global input so I think the technology you know we think that it should be a part of the solution because these technologies are, um, transformative in in what they can bring to society, but they're also, as we've seen in recent history, transformative in some in some of the risks. And so um, we have been really kind of thrilled with the, with the way that this enables scale. Again, it can also create unevenness, but there's also other experiments happening as well. Um, so uh, um, I, I have to acknowledge kind of other industry efforts to do the, um, to, to democratize inputs. Anthropic recently um, published a blog where they used the um, the software Polis to do something called co- um, collective constitutional AI. So Anthropic kind of released the their constitution, maybe, I don't actually, maybe a year ago called constitutional AI that underpinned kind of the rule Rules and the and the paradigm in which their their chatbot cloud um, will operate um, based off of and more recently they use Polis, which is a kind of real time uh, AI facilitated um, crowdsourcing tool to gather more perspectives from people and then inform kind of a different constitutional AI. So and um, the digital um, the the minister of digital affairs in Taiwan, Audrey Tang, is doing something similar using um, not just uh, related to AI, but using Polis software to crowdsource her um, her populace and the the uh, Taiwanese population to inform kind of where there's alignment on certain policy issues or where there's polarization. And so, um, you know, yes, I think Meta, we're really, really excited about the community forums. We're really excited about this platform that can enable discourse at scale. Um, we obviously saw during the pandemic because Zoom, there was there was um, fit, Zoom fatigue famously. Um, but even if it's not that particular platform or that t- particular model, tech, there's other organizations experimenting with technology. I think it, 
it has to be the future. Um, but in the spirit of innovation and everything I've heard here, I think that um, it would behoove anyone that's in this space to really iterate further. And I was really struck by Frederica's comments um, earlier in her talk about, you know, maybe the model isn't necessarily the same when you, you in every region. Maybe you need to meet regions where they are based on their cultural context. And so maybe you have a much more flexible model, um, all enabled by technology maybe, but maybe you change the model depending on where you are, depending about the, uh, it, uh, those individual needs. <laughs> Actually, I was about to wrap up. Uh, so anyways, I would just say, I think uh, s s technology is super exciting, mm -hmm. also you know, relatively untested, and we should continue to innovate. Uh, Federica, do you have a follow-up on kind of uh, digital collective governance or anything about the new online sphere we find ourselves in? Um, yeah, and maybe this will sound uh, peculiar said by me, but I think that the idea that we would uh, uh, sort of like a self-defeatingly uh, 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 eliminate the affordances that technology uh, gives us for uh, participation, for collaboration, uh, would be would be absurd and, and detrimental, I think. Uh, and so in a world in which we necessarily uh, sort of like engage with technology to achieve these types of uh, radically, perhaps decentralized and at scale forms of collaboration and participation, um, I think that as uh, Chris has already suggested, uh, we need to be very much aware of the pitfalls. Um, and I think that there is one particular pitfall that I am concerned about when it comes to technology mediated, particularly generative AI mediated uh, collaboration and participation, which is uh, uh, essentially like what both F uh, Philip and, um, and Forrest earlier discussed at, at the heart of uh, the sort of like engagement and participation that they see, which is this texture of civic norms and of just like collaborative norms that is built, I think, uh, more likely in uh, spaces where people come together physically and engage. And now, this might be empirically incorrect. I'm, I stand to be uh, sort of like a, a, a proven uh, false, uh, but I think that it is something truly to consider. The degree to which online virtual engagements uh, make us even more exposed to the possibility of missing out on this fundamental uh, sort of like a texture of social norms that is essentially what brings uh, us together and what makes democracy work. Um, and so that's that I think uh, something that um, any use of technology in these spaces would have to consider. Mm. And the last question, anyone can take this before we open it up to the audience. So technological advances means it's easier to talk to folks who are not physically present. So maybe our communication ability has increased. But we are also in a world, uh, many places, there's a lot of polarization, in particular, effective polarization, right? So we seem like we're more divided, even though it's easier to talk. And when we think about who um, participates in uh, deliberative mini publics, who responds to the invitation to go debate with fellow citizens for a weekend, giving up kind of time and effort, should we be worried that uh, maybe not in all places, but in some countries, um, the U.S. in particular, it's, you know, it's more common in Europe, all of these institutions, than it is in the U.S. Um, is this something we should be concerned about? Do people not want to talk to each other anymore? And so either the practitioners who have gotten people together or academics who have studied and thought about polarization in institutions, um, anyone can take this. But should we be worried that polarization will slow down the benefits of deliberative democracy? Go ahead. Um, I think I think one of the dangers of polarization is is this kind of siloed um, learning through reinforcement by passively observing others rather than engaging deliberatively with them and passively observing others who are mm. essentially like us. I think it's the kind of thing that you know that leads. Uh, it, it's it's less about immediate affect uh, and more about arriving at posterior beliefs and positions that are that are potentially mistaken, that are influenced by signals from others that are not independent signals, that are sort of from the set of people who are very much like us. It's the kind of thing that leads to people arriving at, people coming to view themselves as having very strong posteriors, such that the, there's no point in engaging in, in deliberation. Um, so it's a substitution of kind of passively reinforced beliefs for, af for actively searching debate or conversation. Um, it's a process that generates relatively stable, contentious posteriors without turning 
um, into kind of a contentious but open-ended and possibly corrective discourse. I'm, I'm worried about that as an effect of polarization. So it's not so much an affect, but this kind of effect on how we perceive the nature of the disagreement and our own beliefs relative to the disagreement. Phil, have you seen this in your practicing? I would say being at Bard, a progressive liberal arts college uh, in the Hudson Valley, I've been of two minds. One is we need to put out the call as quickly and as fat as 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 strongly as possible that there are other me modes of uh, engaging in democracy. Citizens assemblies are it's it's a sort of call to action, right? The issue is that the people who are primed for that, even at this point, primed for even the word democracy, are somewhere to the left of where the right is right now. So. <laughs> You're, you're, it's an uphill battle to sort of reach across the aisle. And sometimes it feels like a naive attempt or like, let's say this, I try to avoid the sort of the, the partisan polarization because I think if you get in like, oh, we're gonna try to get the reds and the blues in the, in the room together, it kind of misses the point where it's like most people probably don't associate with like as a red or a blue or Republican Democrat. Um, so if you try to take the place-based perspective and say like, Anyone out there who wants to th try to create a, a, a better, sort of more collaborative form of democracy, like even thinking through the language on how we talk about citizens' assemblies is like one of the things, you know, at first it was the, uh, sort we were, it was the sortition project at, at Bard, and it was just like, no one knows what that is, sounds super academic, people are gonna write it off as like some idea, like, okay, now it's the Democracy Innovation Hub. After our last conference, we were like, should we call it the, the Center for Citizen Power? You know, like, because there's a question of, of how to relate to in this rapidly polarized like world in which language is changing change so quickly. Um, I think we just have to make the effort and not worry too much about, um, like I think if the intention is there to meet people where they're at and to be open about disagreement, um, ab about tough issues, I think that's the most important thing. But I would say like w the, 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 the people that tend to come to us or email me have like participated in part participatory budgeting, right? Like they're, they're so there's, there's gotta be an intention from, from these efforts as we're organizing them both as citizens or as educational institutions to say, we're gonna do as best as we can to, to you know, reach across different aisles or reach across different sections of the population. Um, without you know, reproducing the sort of stereotype of that idea mm -hmm. it, that, that already exists. I don't know if that, that helps answer the question at all. No, and I mean recruitment and getting the word out that there are these positive experiences from mm -hmm. deliberative mini publics or particip participatory budgeting, that is also the more the work of the people in this room expands, the more people will know. And that's also one of the goals of this conference. Um, so we are actually gonna open it up to the audience. So audience members, if you could raise your hand very high and uh, Pam will come and give you a microphone. And please introduce yourself when you so hi everyone, I'm, I'm Hélène Lindemore, I'm a professor of political science at, at Yale University. I think some of you um, at least maybe uh, will know me as one of the optimists about <laughs> mini publics and pessimists about electoral democracy. And thank you so much for this conference and this panel. It's, it's, it's truly extraordinary, I think, and uh, very symbolically also. I think that it's one of the first conferences on lotteries that I... Um, I think has taken place here. I don't think I organized one. I should have, but anyway, I'm glad to. <laughs> uh, so I have a question for each of you, if, uh, if I'm allowed. Uh, so Federica first, I, I was wondering if you had thoughts on how the Greeks, uh, the ancient Greeks, solved the objections raised by Dimitri. So how come they, for uh, let's say 200 years, um, did without elections and yet were relatively stable and di didn't get captured, at least, you know, uh, you know, to, to in a way that damages our system too much by by I don't know, local economic elites. Like, how, what? So, Dimitri, it's a, it's a question to you as well. Does the Greek case answer some of your questions or not, or is it a completely different case because we're not talking about a transition from an electoral system to a, a you know mini public based system, but it's a completely different system that never had elections for our political functions. I have a question for uh, Chris. Very uh, very nice to meet you. I am excited to hear more about uh, what you're doing at Meta. Uh, 
So given uh, the objections from Dimitri again about you know, what happens when you don't give people real power, in, in particular, and the risk of you know, losing their interest or motivation, and your own claim that you're looking to make the opinions of the participants a bit more binding, um, shouldn't you move towards more of a citizens' assembly model, actually, where it's not just about polling people at the end, but getting them to deliberate towards a goal, towards a recommendation, towards a binding resolution, and then they would function more like your over oversight board, potentially, just a thought. Um, and also, I, can, I have to ask, like, what have you learned at Meta from the open AI uh, governance you know, uh, or board failure of the last week? Um, I would love to, to hear what you have to say, because they were structured as a non-profit and that, that board totally failed. Yeah. You're structured as a for-profit and you're seemingly successfully equipping yourselves with um, constraints of some sort. I don't know how you know, constrained they truly are, but they, they look like they could be. Uh, Dimitri now, <laughs> um, I, I would love to be less of a pessimist about electoral systems and, and I, so I, I'm willing to believe that under some different circumstances somewhere they could be great. But I'd like to hear what do you think is, is, is the standard of success and, and how do you address the, the, the criticism one could make based on the sort of a plutocratic tendencies of, of those systems. There's a, an article in the British Journal of Political Science that came out in June that shows that across like 30 countries, 40 years, 2,000 issues, there's a systematic over-representation or over-congruence, uh, greater congruence with the preferences of, of, um, of rich people in these countries, uh, you know, policies match their preferences more than they match the preferences of poor people, for example, or majorities even. So, so that seems to be a systematic problem. And maybe there's a trade-off there that I'm not seeing, that we're, get, we're gaining more competence, we're, we're gaining something, stability or better protection of minority, you know, in exchange for that plutocratic bias. But I, I would love to hear uh, what it is. Did I? Um, oh, yeah. And... Uh, Philippe, I have a question for you too. I, I, I hear about your work and, and how seemingly um, you know, officials at the city level, maybe the state level, are getting somewhat interested in mini publics and lotteries. But somehow at the federal level, I, I find it very dispiriting how you know, the democracy summits organized by Biden systematically fail to mention deliberative democracy, mini publics, lotteries. It's not at all on their agenda. Why is that? And what can be done? Thank you, sorry, it was very long, but. <laughs> Excellent questions. Um, we'll just go, Federica, if you want to start, and we'll go down the table. Um, hi, Ellen. Thank you for the question. Um, so the Greeks, the, the Athenians did have elections. They used elections to um, uh, select uh, a few magistrates. We don't have evidence of uh, elections in the large bodies that we associate with the democracies, the courts, the assembly, uh, and the council. Uh, but this is, I guess, uh, it is certainly a situation in which there isn't a full-fledged electoral democratic system that then needs to be replaced with a uh, lot of or other types of institutions. But the Greeks were certainly not unaware of elections as a, as a mechanism. Uh, I think that as far as we can tell uh, by looking at people that have studied these questions uh, extensively, uh, democracy without elections in this, the vast majority of uh, sort of like what is the decision making process uh, uh, in a situation that didn't uh, lead to either lead capture, but also, and I think that this is the problem that uh, the, the situation in Athens really uh, generated, which is um, uh, the avoidance of elite capture is one aspect of the story. The other aspect of the story is the avoidance of popular ignorance. So how do a bunch of uh, people on the, sitting on a hill uh, decide on matters of war and peace and finance uh, without really being experts? This is Plato's problem. Um, and I think that uh, some of the authors that have looked at this question, including, of course, uh, Josh Ober, have really looked at the political discourse, at the texture of civic norms, and how very simple mechanisms for selection, for decision making, uh, created a situation in which people shared uh, information and learned. Uh, from coming together in these public, public bodies. So again, I, I think that my work today is sort of like a pushing against the idea that we should uh, continue to obsess with ancient Athens, but Athens remains a fundamental uh, sort of like a place to learn about uh, ancient democracies and pre-modern democracies. Okay, Dimitri. Um, so 
I am going to defer to Federica on all questions having to do with ancient elephants. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do want to um, respond to Ellen's question about how to think about the relative advantages, at least in principle, relative advantages of representative democracy. I think um, one, uh, one dimension where there is something to be said, in particular about uh, representation, has to do with complexity of governance. Um, I think, um, um, uh, direct democratic forms, um, a lot of democratic forms are particularly attractive when um, issue dimensions can be um, can be isolated and dealt with in an, in an isolated way without generating uh, massive externalities with respect to other dimensions. I think when you talk about policy making that has these May kinds I of extern your attention, please. So I think when you talk about policy making with respect to issues that have these kinds of cross issue externalities, I think that's where there is some value, there's considerable value, I would say, right, for something like a representative uh, electoral process with policy makers who are, um, who are given um, uh, a jurisdiction, right, that, that encompasses multiple issues, and, that's, and, and I think that's where, you know, and, and I think our world is sort of increasingly like that, right, or has been increasingly like that for, uh, you know, for at least for the last uh, two plus millennia since, um, you know, since, since ancient Athens. Um, so I think, so that's, that's the way I would direct the argument. Okay, Phil. Okay. Um, so I think uh, we need to run workshops in D.C. with federal uh, government officials, and we just basically we need to find more folks who are willing to organize, knock doors, talk, call elected officials. Um, I think it's already happening, and I don't even think I know that there's other people out there do, starting to do this work that haven't connected because we haven't had enough of these convenings. So um, I just came back from D.C. Uh, yesterday. Uh, um, at the National Conference on Citizenship, uh, the Future of Citizenship, and there was a workshop with Marjan Isasi and, um, and Jillian Youngblood and John Gastel um, on citizens' assemblies at the National Conference of Citizenship. There's now a, a democracy innovation um, center within the um, National Civic League. And I, th I think basically um, we need to organize, I just, <laughs> I'm like my, my Yes, I, I think we basically need to organize convenings, and I think it would be great if Bard and Yale and other colleges thought of this from a collaborative mindset instead. Like, that's the other thing. Like, all of these institutions are set up to have a, a, a competitive mindset. If we got together and said, how do we scale more collaborative uh, um, uh, attempts at this it, uh, together rather than separately, I think we could have a, a bigger impact. Obviously, it cannot just be, like, elite institutions. It's got to be from a... a a multi-stakeholder um, perspective, but these convenings where, inst where anchor institutions have the space and the convening space, I think, um, I, I mean, one thing over the next couple uh, months, and especially this year, 2024, if we can channel some convenings, not to run citizen assemblies, but to do things that are workshopping ideas and calling out to people, because this year, a lot of people are gonna be like, I don't like either of these candidates, I'm depressed about the way this is going, I wish there was some way for me to get involved. So that my, my pitch is let's convene a lot of those actors and then bring in the elected officials and do this multi-stakeholder, um, uh, these convenings and workshop ideas from, from multiple angles. And I think we'll, we'll be successful. I think, I think uh, politicians would, are, there are going to be politicians who start to embrace this as forms of, of the next form of democracy from uh, younger generations especially. And also for the graduate students in the room, this sounds like a great idea for a future dissertation or future research. Mm -hmm. Okay, Chris, finally. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you for the questions. Um, really nice to meet you. I am, I, as I've mentioned, a neophyte in this space, but very have followed your work um, and, and very much an admirer. Um, so on the, um, on the citizens' assembly or the construct that we're using, deliberative polling versus citizens' assembly, I think... Uh, open to innovation, right? I think there's a couple different factors that um, that are unique to a corporate setting that we just need to be mindful of when creating these types of mechanisms. As far as I 
No, there's not a lot of companies that have done this. And so I think we're trying to find our way through it in a way that is as productive as possible, that gives, that honors the, the, the spirit of these mechanisms while also recognizing the like unique constraints of operating in a for-profit company. And so um, the, the deliberative polling method seems to be efficient, scalable, kind of also recognizes that the nature of technology is so fast evolving. And so the questions that we might be asking may not necessarily be the same things as um, a government may be asking citizens to weigh in on a citizen's assembly. Uh, the generative AI community forum, for example, is much more directional since generative AI is different than it was six months ago. It's gonna be different in six, six months in the future. And so we are looking for directional feedback rather than some sort of specific policy outcome. Um, but I think you know, there's we have not put to bed any of any other type of model, and I think we're very open to it. So we'd love to continue the conversation. Um, but this we think is kind of the first step towards um, democratizing inputs in a way that that elevates user voice, um, but is um, it, and does so at the onset of our innovation rather than something that's a redress or a re re um, uh, recourse mechanism. Um, on the open AI thing, you know. Corporate structure, I'm not really an expert in it. I understand the nonprofit versus for-profit structure. I think for me, it just actually reaffirms the need to infuse um, democratic inputs, infuse governance into innovation, because if you're relying on a corporate structure to do that, um, like a nonprofit board, um, that clearly is not, um, um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not um, uh, impervious to, to potential corruption. I don't want to say corruption, but it, potential challenges, right? And so um, I, I think, if anything, it just shows that we need to actually imbue our innovation with governance, and um, that's why I'm excited to work on it. Okay, other questions from the audience? Kevin. Thanks, yes, this is fascinating and interesting to have all these different perspectives. Um, so, so my question might, it's coming from a little bit from this question about sort of uh, the, the top down. Why is there no interest in this and at the federal level? Um, so one of the so the sort of question I would pose is like, um, absent a revolution, um, how would you get from here to there, right? How would you get from here to lotocracy? So think about this in terms of um, absent a revolution, this is going to require elected officials to transfer authority, right? They're going to have to adopt these institutions for some reason. So that seems to me to suggest like uh, one set of questions um, uh, that we might have answers to that we want to have answers to are what can deliberative many publics do for elected leaders? Um, and I don't just mean things like we can improve our democracy. They're not really going to care about that, right? Um, what can it do for them in a more mercenary way? Now, that mercenariness can can be a, a bunch of different things. One thing would be like, it takes an issue like abortion off our plates, right? In Ireland, one of the reasons they want to do this is because they did not want to deal with this question and marriage equality. That's going to blow up our, our party if we try to deal with that. Um, another uh, uh, sort of possibility, and here is one that um, I know the beginning of the story, but not the end. Um, so Mike Neblo, um, for a while, was doing these, um, it was my understanding he had members of Congress, especially freshmen, oh, were going to engage in these um, forums where they spoke with their um, randomly selected uh, constituents, right? Yeah. Um, and so, because one of the big challenges here is, is one way of thinking about this is getting citizens to trust deliberate many publics, but what about, right? getting elected officials who are the ones who are going to have to transfer authority to these institutions. How do you get them uh, uh, to trust them? So I don't know how M Mike's thing has turned out. I know he did some, some um, pilots, but then he thought he was doing a bigger one. So I, I wonder what you guys think about that. I wonder if you know <laughs> how this has turned out. Maybe other people in the room do. Um, so yeah, so that, that, that's sort of my question. Um, uh, how can we do that? Uh, and then... Um, uh, because I feel like that might be a solution to some of these questions about scaling up, some of these questions about about also the attractiveness, right? If there's not a way to get from here to there, if there's not a way to answer that question of what can this do for, for politicians absent revolution, then you might be out, out of luck. Um, I'll answer. You were looking at me mostly, so I'll try to... Um, <laughs> the, I think we ask them. We go. So what we've been doing, what Forrest and I've been doing, is we call up the mayor's office. We email this other agency. We email the Department of Transportation. We email the senators. We, email, you know, like write Joe Biden. You know, not we're not gonna write Joe Biden. That's a bad idea. But basically, what are you? What What is really hard 
And this is a model. We're not willing to just like spend all of our time doing something for you as a PR or like um, engagement trick that you're trying to run, right? Like we're citizens. We think this model is, 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 could be the future of democracy. What are you willing to do power sharing on or to think through? Or what is some issue that could be really hard? It, 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 that is an open question that we have to go to the agencies and we have to, um, like basically the, 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 the things we've learned from the folks in like Australia or healthy democracy, all, you know, um, we've been learning from folks who've been doing this for, for decades and they go and they ask, what is really difficult? Like what's the most difficult thing you face? Um, and then they workshop different topics and then you have to figure out trade-offs and anything. And then I don't think from, I think that starts a conversation and then other conversations open up. Like we've been working with the mayor's office of engagement in New York and it turns out that, you know, that's, that's a unique office because they, uh, they serve as a coordinating role for all public engagement up from the city side. So they have unique insights and they say, well, you know, so there's a whole conversation that opens up and then there's a conversation of how do we as citizens relate to this office? Right, because it's it's a it's trust building. When when we started doing it, I honestly it, we've built trust in a way in that having that conversation from the inside and the outside. So I think like we basically need to reach out and ask them how you know what are what are the ways they, they would interact with this model, and then we learn. Oh, some people want to use it for bad reasons. We don't want to work with them. Some people have really good ideas. Um, maybe there's already an existing thing that they're doing in their agency that is a lot like this, or some citizen oversight board that we could um, help them implement. It doesn't have to be a citizen's assembly. It's more like, let's, let's meet people where they're at and workshop these ideas. I, that, that's been our approach. And also, sorry, if I can just jump in, one model to look at is Belgium that has deliberative committees that bring together elected politicians and randomly selected citizens to debate with each other. So if politicians are going to learn about the efficacy of deliberative democracy, that is one way where if you treat all of those politicians, or at least we should be looking to Belgium to see if politicians, those politicians that have experienced deliberative committees are more likely to support the implementation of this institution in, in, in other levels. Um, okay, another question. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, Dimitri, go ahead. <clears throat> I think deliberative mini publics give an opportunity to politicians who do not want to pander, right, to uh, an opportunity to, um, to create an independent source of information mm -hmm. that might have some standing among, among their constituency and, and enable them to avoid pandering. So I think there is that kind of an, it doesn't mean obviously it's not true of every politician. Right. It's true of politicians who, you know, who would welcome an opportunity to take a position that's different from the one that they're taking and that could enable them to do that. I have just something, a slight add on to that. Um, aside from my role at Meta, I, there's a, at University of Maryland, I believe his name's Stephen Call, um, runs the Voice of the People, which is a deliberative poll outfit. Um, they specifically engage constituents and do deliberative polls to uh, to address polarization, to show uh, members of Congress that actually, when given information and opportunity to engage with one another, people are not actually as polarized, and to hopefully um, to to um, to encourage members of Congress to to change positions on certain issues. So it's not the same, but uh, just an, another another way that people are using deliberation um, to support the overall kind of system. Okay, we have time for one more question. Do we have another question? Yeah, right there, Pam. Eliza. Um, hey, I'm Eliza Oak, PhD candidate in poli sci here at Yale. Um, so I'm curious how you think about which decisions are better suited for collective decision making in the first place, mm -hmm. as opposed to which decisions should be made by a smaller group of experts and representatives. Mm -hmm. For example, do you think you know, we should optimize around what are the most controversial decisions that the public's divided on in hopes of these discussions could kind of, you know, encourage dialogue, broader consensus, or of course there's other considerations, maybe, you know, um, making sure the topic is sufficiently approachable and not too complex. But curious, especially for the practitioners, how you think about that in practice. Um, thanks, Eliza, and I'm a big fan of your work too. I love the the article that you wrote with Andy Hall, and you can teach me about Web three and and decentralized governance anytime. Um, 
I, maybe I can just share a little bit of how we're thinking about it. I think probably it's going to be a little bit different from um, some, some folks that focus more on public institutions. Um, the way that we have thought about it to date is um, because actually right now, I mean, there's obviously things that are cont highly contested um, uh, around social media and technology, um, but because a lot of the technology is emerging, what we've found is actually like, you know, things on the metaverse or things even on generative AI, they're not super polarized yet. So for us, we were looking for um, a lot of gray space where there's not really necessarily a clear guiding perspective, either in public or at the company. Um, so where there's maybe not polarized perspectives, but maybe just like a lack of consensus um, where we could explore and probe. Um, again, coming from a, a for-profit organization, also something that we're confident that we would actually want to um, hear public input input on, right? Um, there are some decisions that um, that the company is going to say um, is is within the company's domain, um, but that we would actually be able to to um, valuable um, actually be able to um, uh, solicit input on. And then the other one is around, um, you know, how do we bring um, participants along? And is it something that it's not so technical um, that we could actually, you know, enable through deliberation, education, and expert engagement, um, the people to, to have a rich discussion and give us valuable feedback and something that they can actually um, uh, participate in. And so, um, you know, we found certainly through all of our pilots that we were impressed by the richness of the discussions and the deliberations, even on things that are, are pretty technical. But you can imagine that coming from a technology company, there are things that are so, and actually um, things like Web3, I mean, I'm not sure, I'm not convinced that everyone would be able to grasp every technical detail about our technology. And so um, finding something that is fit for purpose um, for, for deliberation in terms of the accessibility of the topic as well. Phil, final response, a brief one if you can. Yeah, I just point to uh, Forrest. Uh, if I, I don't think you saw uh, Forrest's presentation this morning, but it's recorded. So he went through sort of the way we're th we thought about a, a democratically legitimate way to arrive at a, an issue in New York City around energy and climate, for instance, which you might have um, some formal body, team of experts, whether it's the N New York uh, version of the uh, um, IPCC, um, deliver sort of the, or, or a team of, of university sort of professors who have studied the, the biggest climate impacts or the biggest challenges facing the energy system in New York, right? Or the en or energy transition. Um, and then, you know, list out those five and then have a citywide poll of some sort or an engagement mechanism in which everyday people are saying, oh, I, we want to be involved with that. This is, they've also done this in, um, Oh, I'm actually blanking on how on how they went where they did this, but basically, oh, in Belgium, I think, um, on the deliberative committees, if I'm not wrong, um, going back and forth, where the politicians say we're willing. Again, you go into the politicians, we're willing to work on these five issues, and then taking those five, asking a, the, the public of these five, what's the most important, and then maybe going back to the experts, right? There's, so there's a. Um, oh, I'm supposed to be short, so I'll just I'll stop there. But I think. Designing a democratic mechanism to arrive at that and, and doing engagement with that rather than there just being some topic that comes like a UFO, like the immediate thing, if there's not a good messenger, is like who chose this topic, right, I think. And so regretfully, we're out of time, but thankfully, this panel and the entire conference today has been recorded, and you can find um, information about the conference, contact details for the presenters, and the video clips on the Yale ISBS website under the Democratic Innovations Program. I'd like to take this opportunity to again thank Yale ISPS, Alan Gerber, Pam, and Kira for helping us organize this conference, and thank you so much to our panelists and all participants. Thank you to Ollie. Yeah. Oh, Thank <laughs> you.